Hi, everyone. We're going to get started in just one minute. We'll give everyone a second to log on. Okay, cool. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for coming to the September RDLA webinar. Um, this month is going to be focused on newborn screening in honor of September being Newborn Screening Awareness Month. So to get started, we do offer closed captioning. Um, if you would like to have the line, live transcript of the meeting on your screen, please just click the live transcript button at the bottom of your window to begin the transcription. We also offer Spanish translation. Um, so if you would like to have that, you can just click the link that's been posted in the chat and it will pop up for you. So our agenda for today is here. So we're gonna start off hearing from Paul Melmeyer. He's gonna speak to us about the newborn screening stays loss reauthorization act. Then we will hear from Dylan Simon who is gonna speak about uh, the newborn screening modernization study and state RUSP alignment legislation. Next, we'll hear from Dean Sir, who is gonna to speak to us about advocating to the advisory committee on heritable disorders in newborn and children. Then we'll hear from Randy Clyde, uh, who is gonna to speak to you about how to interact with your state newborn screening officials. And then last but not least, we'll have Ron Delbeck, and he is going to speak to you about uh, the Advancing Access to Precision Medicine Act. So, Paul, I will go ahead and turn it over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Kaylin. Uh, can you hear me? Give me a thumbs up. Yep, we can hear you. All right. Fantastic. Well, thank you again uh, for, for having me, Kaylin, and thank you, RDLA, as well, for, for having uh, me join you all today to discuss the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act. Uh, I'm Paul Melmeyer. I'm the Vice President of Public Policy and Advocacy at the Muscular Dystrophy Association. And uh, just in case you don't know us, we serve the uh, neuromuscular disease patient population uh, through a variety of educational programs, advocacy programs, uh, awareness raising, uh, other services, of course. Uh, so uh, advocacy, of course, being one of our focuses and newborn screening being particularly important to the neuromuscular disease community. Um, this is an issue on which we're very pleased uh, to, to, to lead. So we can move to the next slide. So uh, we, we just want to focus today, or I want to focus today, on uh, the reauthorization effort uh, happening up on uh, Capitol Hill. And this is for the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act of 2021. Um, now, this is a piece of legislation you've probably already heard about over the course of the last several years, as this has been not only a priority for MDAs over the last uh, several years, uh, but also Every Life and NORD and a lot of other rare disease groups as uh, newborn screening is, is, as I said, already very important to um, the rare disease uh, community. Just to give you a little bit of uh, a background on what the legislation would do, uh, the legislation uh, would reauthorize uh, the key federal programs that assist states in the administration and upkeep essentially of uh, their newborn screening programs. Uh, newborn screening, as you either already know or we'll certainly hear more about in future presentations here, are largely actually state-run programs. It's up to the states on what screen they add on to their uh, panel. It's up to the states to create the system thereafter for getting blood spots to the labs. And then uh, if there's positive screen, confirmatory diagnoses from there, and then follow up for families uh, after that, if there is indeed a positive diagnosis. Uh, but nonetheless, the federal government plays a very important role in uh, supporting states and uh, trying to take on a lot of the roles that states themselves may uh, not otherwise be able to do themselves. So this reauthorization bill would reauthorize those federal programs. Now, uh, this is actually past due. Uh, for, for those of you who've been tracking this for a little while, you know that uh, the reauthorization for these programs actually lapsed in September of 2019. The previous authorization had passed Congress in 2014 and uh, lasted five years. And so of course that expired in 2019. It's been about two years since we've actually had an authorized federal newborn screening program. So we're trying to fix that. 
Uh, and we're working with lead sponsors in both the House and the Senate side. Uh, Congresswoman Rogel Allard and Congressman Simpson on the, the House side have been champions. On the Senate side, Senator Wicker of Mississippi and Senator Hassan of uh, New Hampshire have been our leaders on the Senate side. So it's not all bad news, there is good news. The legislation actually did pass the House in June, which is, as, as, as all of us who have worked on legislation, uh, you know, other legislation for that matter, we know that it's very difficult to pass anything out of any House. So the fact that we were able to get the bill passed out of the House in June uh, was, was, very, was very important and really a testament to all the work that all the advocates across the rare disease community have done uh, to gain support for the legislation. But we're still awaiting action in the Senate. Uh, and I'll get to our Senate efforts here in a second, but just to, again, kind of back up and let you know what the bill does, uh, not only does it reauthorize the programs that are important to states uh, to assist them in their newborn screening programs, it also raises the authorization funding levels for the CDC's program, which uh, is the Quality uh, and Technical Assistance Program, which assists state labs in actually uh, running the tests and running the screens and making sure that everything's happening in an expedited manner. And then it also would raise the authorization level of funding for the HRSA program, which is the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders, uh, which we'll, you'll hear a little bit more about later, I see in future presentations. It also refines the authorized activities at NIH, uh, which is the Hunter Kelly uh, Newborn Screening Research Program, which actually funds pilot studies for new newborn screens. And then also would uh, refine the authorities for CDC and HRSA, just trying to basically keep up uh, with the uh, keep up with the uh, ongoing evolution of newborn screening, make sure that the language in the statute is keeping up with that. Finally, and perhaps most uh, excitingly, it also commissions a report from the National Academy of Medicine, which would really look at how newborn screening in general can keep up with the advancements in gene and cell-based therapy development, keep up with advancements in genetic testing and other advanced diagnostics, making sure that newborn screening is keeping up with just advancements in medicine uh, and uh, clinical care more generally. Uh, and this report would make recommendations to not only us, but federal government, to lawmakers on how to make sure newborn screening is, is keeping up. So let's move to the next slide. So I mentioned that we're, we're still awaiting Senate action. So you might be thinking, okay, so what's, what's the holdup? Well, there, there are several things to consider here. Um, so one of the issues that we've been facing over the last several years, and actually even before then, is that some senators are pushing for an informed consent requirement to be added onto all newborn screening uh, blood spots uh, collection. Uh, and uh, we are not in agreement with this. And there are several reasons for why. Uh, first, uh, the newborn screens that uh, are taken with uh, the little heel prick uh, from the baby and then sent off to the lab to be screened for uh, the uh, conditions that the state has included on their uh, newborn screening panels. Uh, from there, those blood spots are incredibly important to actually conduct the research needed to not only refine our current newborn screens that are on state panels, but also actually add screens uh, to, to, to state panels. As I don't need to tell all of you that many rare diseases are even rarer than one in a million for that matter. And if we're to actually catch that one in a million disease at birth through a screen, we need to have millions of blood spots to be able to actually test uh, what screens, what technologies would be able to catch these rare diseases at birth. And if we are to add an informed consent requirement at the outset, uh, not only could this lead to um, you know, some, some blood spots not being included in this research, but also it actually could lead to many states just choosing not to uh, collect these blood spots for research at all, because this is an unfunded mandate on states that are already quite cash strapped, that are already uh, underfunded when it comes to these programs. And we've actually already seen this occur in some states in which the process for uh, actually the newborn screening uh, blood spots to be uh, taken and used for research following the initial screen, uh, that that becomes so arduous, they just don't do it at all. And then we're missing a lot of critical, critical, critical information that goes into actually testing new screens and could actually lead to a complete halt, essentially, of research on new newborn screenings. And for all of the rare diseases that are hoping for a newborn screen in the future, includes many in the neuromuscular disease patient population, many in yours perhaps as well, um, that, uh, that would be just horrendous to, to, to witness. So that's why we're opposed to this, but there are still, again, some senators who are, are pushing for this requirement. What we're also facing is that the healthcare agenda in the Senate is substantial. I don't need to tell you 
just how much uh, those in the Senate side, House side, and President Biden, for that matter, are trying to achieve in healthcare, not only just in general, but especially over the course of the summer right now in September and uh, through the rest of the year. So we're just really trying to essentially compete for oxygen in the room, trying to get newborn screening back on top of the agenda. But we are working to find a way to get this bill through the Senate. And as I said, the path is complicated, but uh, we're working with uh, Senate partners, our, our leaders, uh, Senator Hassan and Senator Wicker, as already mentioned, and then uh, our supporters on the Senate Health Education uh, uh, Labor and Pensions Committee, especially Senator Patty Murray, who's the chairwoman of that committee, working with her and her staff uh, to actually find a way to get this bill passed through the Senate. One thing that is also kind of a, a piece of good news to all of this is that even though the reauthorization has technically lapsed two years ago, uh, then uh, a lot of the work is actually able to still continue at the CDC and HRSA because there were some fail safes essentially worked into the legislation before and Congress has continued to appropriate uh, for these two programs so that a lot of the work can continue. But again, it's continuing under old reauthorization language with uh, without any updates for the 21st century really here, without any update over the last seven years of what we wanted to be doing and no National Academies report either. So while it's not really a dire situation, we really still do need to get uh, the reauthorization passed. So let's move on to the next slide. So how can you help? Uh, there are two things that I wanna mention here. First of all, contact your Senator and ask them to co-sponsor the legislation. The way that we're gonna get this through the Senate is likely to have this added on to another piece of legislation that is going to pass the Senate sometime uh, later this year. It could be a funding bill, could be another must pass authorization uh, piece of legislation. But the easiest way to get the newborn screening bill passed through the Senate is just to add it on to something else that's moving. And in order for us to be able to do that, we need to make it very clear to uh, the Senate leadership, that's Senator Chuck Schumer and that's Senator Mitch McConnell, that there's widespread support for this legislation across both of their caucuses. And the way to do that is co-sponsors. If we have a lot of co-sponsors on the legislation from both Democrats and Republicans, we're able to show that this is a bipartisan bill that is widely supported and is easy to add on to any piece of legislation that they're otherwise gonna pass. So I have uh, here, and I know this is a webinar, so you can't click on it, but I think I saw in the chat, Dean, you were putting some links in there. Thank you for that. Uh, there, there's a number of action alerts you can use to actually contact your Senator. You can use ours at MDA, uh, at mba.org backslash advocacy. You can get it pretty quickly there. Every Life has an alert as well. Um, there's uh, the image of the URL there. And then uh, NORD has an action alert, and perhaps your organization has an action alert, there's a lot out there. Uh, but just the important thing is contact your senator, ask them to co-sponsor the legislation, ask them to support it. One final plug before I uh, turn it over uh, back, back to Caitlin is, uh, if you are a North Carolinian, you have a special opportunity to actually impact the legislation because perhaps the most important senator that we need to convince to support the legislation as is, is Senator Richard Burr. He's a ranking member of the HELP uh, committee. He's the lead Republican on that committee. And if he is supportive of the legislation, he's the first person that Mitch McConnell is likely to turn to to ask, can we actually add this onto some other piece of legislation? If we have his support, then that means it's a lot easier to get this bill passed this year. So uh, I will say it's especially important for you to call or to email or to text or send a, a pigeon to uh, Senator Burr to try to convince him to support this legislation. Uh, but also, if you want to even go a little bit further than that, uh, let us know. You'll have my email on the next slide, Caitlin, you can move there. Uh, uh, Dylan also, of course, has been spending a lot of time, a lot of his time on this legislation. Uh, let him know also if you want to uh, go a little bit further in trying to convince uh, Senator Burr if you are North Carolinian and uh, want to go a little bit further to try to support the legislation. So I'll stop there. I don't think we're taking questions now. We might be at the end. Caitlin, I defer to you on that. But again, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Paul. So if anyone does have any questions for Paul, we can go ahead and quickly take those now. So Paul, we have one question. Um, someone said, I'm a little confused. I thought there was already informed consent with newborn screening. Um, could you explain? Yes, yeah, so uh, we're, we're talking about uh, newborns, uh, we're talking about informed consent for the secondary use of the blood spot. So for the use of the uh, same blood spot that's taken for the newborn screen itself, uh, but then can be used in research thereafter. And it's that system, uh, it's that requirement that uh, there are some senators that want to place 
on newborn screening more generally, on states to have to come up with some sort of system for this. Um, and it's that requirement that we believe could be uh, very uh, deleterious to the newborn screening effort across the United States. So um, it's that informed consent requirement that I'm specifically mentioning that I don't believe necessarily is a blanket requirement across all 50 states and territories right now that is what the senators, uh, what Senator uh, Paul specifically is, uh, is, is advocating for. Great, thank you so much, Paul. So now we will move over to Dylan. Um, and please remember everyone, if you do have any questions, to put them in the Q&A box and we will ask each speaker after their presentation is ended. Uh, so Dylan, I'll hand it over to you. Caitlin, uh, and thank you, Paul, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, as Paul said, we do work uh, closely with him and the, and the full Newborn Screen Coalition on that effort. Uh, and so we're really excited to keep moving forward. Uh, I'm actually gonna start with state Newborn Screen legislation. Uh, and I'm very excited to be doing that. Um, and I also wanna let you guys know that we're going to, I'm gonna talk broadly about the legislation itself. Uh, and then Randy, who's gonna be speaking a little bit later, we'll talk a little more in depth about the efforts and, and how to talk about, how to talk to your state Newborn Screen officials when trying to go about this legislation. Uh, so to start, uh, just some facts on newborn screening. Uh, newborn screening reaches each of the 4 million newborns born every year. Uh, it, is, it is, at its core, is a public health program that reaches the entire country. Uh, and that is actually incorrect number, that is my apologies. Uh, that is one in 300 newborns, not one in 178, but one in 300 newborns as a condition that can be detected through newborn screening. Uh, and newborn screening tests for a variety of genetic, metabolic, uh, and functional conditions that are not otherwise apparent at birth. Uh, and this last point uh, is really the key part of newborn screening. Uh, newborn screening facilitates timely delivery of life-saving treatments and other therapies that improve the quality of life. Uh, a key part of newborn screening is that it's done when individuals and newborns are asymptomatic. Uh, so uh, if, you, if you look at a newborn, they, they look healthy, uh, but they do have this condition and beginning treatment as soon as possible uh, can make a huge impact uh, in the quality of life. And so that is really at the core of newborn screening is providing that timely diagnosis so that you can begin treatment uh, as soon as possible. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and so Paul touched briefly about this, but it's important to know that there is kind of a federal versus state newborn screening programs. Uh, and so we're gonna focus a little bit on the state program. Um, and so, at the end of the day, the final decision for which conditions each individual state screens for does lie with the state. And while there is a federal recommended panel, uh, it is just that recommended. Uh, and so each state does have the, the final say and the final decision on which conditions they screen for. Uh, and the screenshot you see here uh, is actually from our action center, uh, which you can reach at rarescreen.org, uh, which I will put in the chat as I speak. Um, and so, that is a great place to learn more about your state specifically uh, and, and the work that they're doing within newborn screening and how each of this, these aspects relate to your individual state. Uh, and so in addition, uh, each state may have an advisory council uh, for newborn screening. Uh, they also, as we discussed earlier, how long they store their dry blood spots. Now that will vary from no time to indefinite. Uh, as well as how they're funded, newborn screening fees, and who actually conducts the testing. Uh, and so that will vary. So uh, a lot of states uh, conduct their own testing. Uh, there are a small handful of states that ask uh, for private labs, mostly per Elmer, to do testing for them. Uh, and there are also a handful of states that conduct testing on behalf of other states. So the, a great example of that is for Massachusetts. Massachusetts conducts the actual lab testing uh, for all of New England. And so that's a, the reason I bring that up is because it's another indication of how states vary greatly. Uh, there is a, a phrase within the New Orleans community uh, that if you have learned and seen one state New Orleans screening program, you have only learned and seen about one student state New Orleans screening program. Each of the 50 programs vary a little bit uh, and have their each unique quirks. Uh, and little aspects, and while generally they all are moving towards the same goal, which they are, uh, how they go about that, it can vary uh, state to state. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and so with that, we, because of that, we pursue what we call Rust-Aligned legislation. Uh, and so the Rust, as stated, the Recommended Uniform Screening Panel 
is a evidence-driven process that can take five, 10, 15 years to develop a nomination package uh, to submit and then get approval to be added to the Rust. Um, following that, it can take on average five to six years for once a condition is added to the Rust to when states begin screening for it. Uh, and there are documented cases uh, that take that is taking as long as nine or 10 years. Uh, and so while we recognize that states are not able uh, to add a condition immediately once they add to the Rust, because they have to make sure that they implement the proper follow-up services. They have to ensure the fact that they can actually screen for this condition, making sure that they have that knowledge base. Uh, and well, as well as the side of aid for adding this additional screening, do we need to increase our funding source? Do we have to hire additional workers? So we understand that it all takes time, but we also believe that five to six years is too long. Uh, in addition, uh, when submitting a Rust nomination package, uh, that comes from a patient advocacy organization. And so while they, there are important coalitions uh, that put those packages together uh, and you have clinicians and physicians and researchers are involved in that as well as a patient advocacy organization. Patient advocacy organizations are generally the ones who are bringing that package together. Unfortunately, once they have done that, they are then also in charge of going to each of the individual 50 states to ensure that the states then add it to their state panel. Uh, and so Russell Lyman legislation really came out of that is, is trying to take one take a rock out of that backpack and, and to really ensure the fact that we are helping patient advocacy as best we can in, in working to help in this area. Uh, and so it really focuses on three areas. Uh, first, it requires the state to screen for any disorder recommended by the federal Russ. Uh, I, Two important aspects about this part uh, is first and foremost, it does not, um, it, it still allows for the addition of other conditions. And so if a condition is not on the RUSP and the state believes that the evidence is there to add it, then the state can still add conditions that are not yet on the RUSP. Uh, it, it really gets to the idea that currently the RUSP is viewed as the goal, uh, and we hope that the RUSP is viewed as the minimum. Uh, in addition, it goes back, it implements a timeline. Uh, so we want to shorten that five to six year period. Uh, generally, the timeline that we have agreed upon that has been passed is anywhere between two to three years. Uh, and so again, that is cutting it almost in half of how long it currently takes uh, to add a condition to the state uh, to, to what it would be in these Russ alignment states. Uh, in addition, if we are going to require states to add these conditions uh, in a certain amount of time, we want to make sure that there is funding available. Uh, and so again, this we go in with these elements. We do not go in with a specific bill language uh, because each state is unique uh, and each state has its own unique relationships, which Randy can, we'll talk a little bit about. Uh, but in 2021, we pursued rest alignment legislation in four states. Next slide, please. Right, okay. Um, and so we're actually, we're really excited about what we've done this year. So in Georgia, Ohio, and North Carolina, uh, it was signed into law, uh, which we were very excited about in North Carolina. We were waiting passage in the Senate. Uh, it was passed out of the House uh, as an individual bill and has also been included in the House budget. So hopefully one of those will get us over the finish line. Uh, we, we are excited about our prospects for getting this done in North Carolina, uh, but we're, we're still working hard to get that done. Uh, and so I, we're really excited about our alignment. We're gonna continue, continue these efforts into 2022. Uh, and so we're, we're very excited about that. So if you, if you have any questions about our alignment, into 2022, uh, I would recommend that you reach out to me. I'm happy to answer any questions about that. Uh, and if you have any questions about Russell Lyman in general, about the actual theme, the legislation, uh, please feel free to post them in the Q&A box. Uh, and then next slide, so I have a quick one about the monitors and study. Perfect. Uh, and so this kind of goes hand in hand with what Paul is talking about in terms of the monitors and study that is included in the reauthorization. And so I, I want to, I'll move quickly through this, uh, but we are working with uh, other leaders within the rare disease space uh, to essentially conduct a, an additional newborn screening modernization study. Uh, and so we're working with RTI to evaluate the capacity of the newborn screening within the US to provide a timely diagnosis of all newborns who may benefit from new treatments. Uh, and so we're very excited about this. Uh, and we're also happy to announce that we uh, are hoping to publish our, the results of the study uh, in the coming months. But what we can definitely do uh, is in the coming weeks, uh, please do be on the lookout uh, for registration to be made available for the Rare Disease Congre Congressional Caucus Briefing. Uh, that will be occurring from October on October 25th from 2 to 3 p.m., uh, in which we will discuss uh, the study as well as some findings from the study, 
uh, at that briefing, uh, Don, Dr. Don Bailey uh, from RTI, who helped lead the study, um, will we'll be able to join. And so we're very excited about that. Uh, and so again, I, I, I don't want to go into too much detail at the moment because uh, I don't, we can't quite talk about the results yet, but we will be able to talk a little bit more about them on the 25th briefing. Uh, and so we're very excited about that. And so I do encourage uh, everyone to be able to attend that. And again, as I said, please do be on the lookout uh, for registration to be made available uh, within the coming weeks. With that, does anybody have any questions for me? Uh, and thank you everybody for your time today. I see some Thank stuff you, Dylan. So I'm not seeing any in the Q&A box. Let's see. Uh, I'm just looking in the chat and I am going to echo um, what Amy Gavilio is a wonderful resource uh, and you are very lucky so that she just gave everybody, she just gave all of you her email address. So I would, uh, Amy, I apologize for this, but I would highly encourage any community if you have any questions to reach out to Amy. Uh, she's a wonderful resource. Uh, someone who I happily will email with any questions that I have. So definitely take her up on that. And Kate, I'll pass back to you. Yeah, I just see one question, Dylan, asking if you can repeat the information about the caucus briefing. Yes, uh, the caucus briefing and Shannon beat me to it. Uh, it will be <laughs> on October 25th uh, from 2 to 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. Uh, and we're really excited about that. And again, be on the lookout uh, from Caitlin and Shannon on registration for that. Perfect, thank you, Dylan. Great, so now we will hear from Dean, sir. Dean, I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Dean, you're still on mute. I always talk to myself, so I'm just comfortable. <laughs> uh, I want to speak to you today about uh, how to have an impact with the advisory committee uh, that we, we know most as uh, the committee that uh, is involved in the uh, RUSP nominations and approvals. But as uh, Paul Melmeyer pointed out, uh, the work of that committee is much broader. And so I want to give you a little perspective, and then we'll talk about some of the meat of that. Uh, next slide. Uh, we mentioned Amy Gaviglio, in addition to having uh, the best uh, shoes in the newborn screening system, she's also done uh, a lot of work in a lot of parts of the ecosystem. It's very complicated. This slide is from her. And I've circled in there in blue down towards the bottom, just the one little piece that the advisory committee does. It's a critical piece, but it by no means is the, uh, is the whole ecosystem. And we need to keep that in mind when we're communicating to them and when we're trying to accomplish the big goal, which for each of us in uh, advocacy groups is to um, get, get our uh, screens uh, in place so that uh, babies are detected at birth. Uh, next slide. This slide is extremely busy. I'd encourage you just to go and search for ACHDNC mission and this will come up, but uh, again, I wanted to point out that the duties of the committee go beyond the RUSP. Uh, they have a lot of engagement with state and in policy, as uh, as Dylan has pointed out, <clears throat> as Dylan pointed out a moment ago, um, uh, they're involved in in setting future and future policies and directions for newborn screening, both in guidance and in practice. Uh, we know newborn screening is a, a state level program, but there's a lot of guidance that comes from the federal government. So you can read the details uh, of this by searching it yourself. Uh, next slide. The advisory committee process is very structured. It has tight timelines. It's very well organized. You've, uh, if you've been on the newborn screening boot camp um, last week, you would have seen this. If not, go back and uh, catch uh, the links and the, the videos from that. Um, that's another Every Life program. Um, but it, it is very structured and evidence-based. And I think that is the key thing that, uh, that we need to keep in mind as we're talking to this committee, because so many of our stories and what uh, uh, patients typically do with the committee is very story-based and we need to connect it to the ACHDNC process. Next slide. As they work through that process, they fill out a decision matrix or they, they, they put your evaluation into this decision matrix. And you can see there's a series of, of criteria on the left and they're scoring A1, A2, A3 and B and C and so on. Um, uh, in the middle and towards the right. And what they are doing is taking all of that very, very complex, pub typically published information or nearly published information uh, and, and converting that into a decision. And what, what uh, is a challenge for that is that 
Each of our disorders is different. Each of the, uh, uh, the issues and the concerns that we have, our therapies, the decision process, the certainty of knowing you know, early onset, later onset, all those things are different across each disorder. So one of the struggles that the committee has is how to adapt this decision matrix uh, to a particular disorder. And I think that's a place where we can have a strong influence. Uh, the committee has shown that they have some flexibility. These lines aren't exactly vertical or exactly horizontal. There's, a, there's some squiggle and, and wiggle room in them. Not a lot, but, the, but there is some. Next slide, please. But what you didn't see in any of that is the patient voice in any absolute sense. There is not a formal uh, input channel for the patient voice into that decision matrix. We have a different avenue into that. So there's a lot of people that are contributing to um, the advisory committee and they're hearing from a lot, of, uh, a lot of different parts of the ecosystem. Next slide. And I've listed a few of those here. The state labs, concerns about budget, staff, capacity, equipment, um, just uh, space in some cases. Uh, public health, as we know, the state labs are part of the public health system. What happens to these babies in terms of referrals uh, and diagnostic confirmations post state lab clinicians, uh, clinical researchers, ethics, biopharma committees, legislators, uh, as Dylan pointed out, there's gotta be funding for uh, new uh, screening and so on. So it is, uh, it's, a, it's a noisy space. And if you've listened to the committee meetings, they seem very structured and organized and they are, but there's a lot of people, not just at the table, but particularly around the table in terms of the additional groups that are, that are weighing in on these decisions. Next slide. And I think the, uh, the, the missing voice or the voice we want to bring out, and I'll talk about here in a moment or two, uh, is the patient voice, the, uh, the so-called elephant in the room. Uh, we, there are more of us than there are them. We certainly, they're very passionate. I love the committee. I love the work they do. I love the structure. I'm an engineer. I appreciate having, ha having a known entity and how it works uh, to, to be able to deal with, but we have to be able to influence that. Next slide. The um, uh, advisory committee has just finished a two-year evaluation of you know, who they are, what are they doing, how do they go about it, what should they change in the future? And one of the comments I think is very profound, and it talks about patient family perspectives. It says the committee's process does not currently assess the values of different stakeholders, particularly the patients and the families most impacted. And at this point, they've opted to not do anything specific about that. So they know it's a challenge, but they haven't addressed it yet. <clears throat> Now, those of you that have been around the rare disease space a long time probably have seen this before, uh, this, this, this situation. Um, the FDA went through this starting, I don't know, 10, 10 years, 10 plus years ago, when they started uh, gathering in the patient voice. Uh, those patient-focused drug development uh, sessions and so on. The FDA also is very evidence-based, in spite of what you may be seeing on the evening news about all the politics of all this, they are really an evidence-based organization. And they didn't know how to take the patient voice in. Um, they have figured that out. They're good at listening. Uh, it's not clear exactly how all of that information is now being put into the decisions. And we're going to see that same quandary come up here with the advisory committee. They're just a few years behind. Uh, next slide. So what I want to do for the next few minutes is really talk about the practical side of how can we be heard and most importantly, not just be heard, but have an impact. Next slide. So I think the key thing is to do your homework. It's to really understand how the system works, know what the advisory committee processes are, know what their goals are, know how they think and act and respond, uh, anticipate their concerns. Again, usually that's evidence. If there's a weakness in your nomination, um, they're, they're gonna pull it out and they're gonna want to have their external review committee uh, dig in on that. I'd encourage you to read the other nominations and the committee responses. You may not understand the science, but you certainly can learn from the process what, um, what other organizations have gone through, what worked for them, and frankly, what didn't. Um, there's been a number of negative um, responses, uh, either nominations that weren't initially accepted or some that were declined. You can learn a lot from that. So do your homework. All of this information is available on the committee's website. Just search for uh, ACHDNC. Next. <clears throat> In terms of the evidence, Again, as I mentioned, it's a very evidence-based group. I apologize for slide formatting here. Some of this has bumped around. Uh, but build a strong and respected team of advisors that are helping you with your nomination. As those of you that, that understand the nomination process uh, probably have come to learn, usually these nominations are submitted by an advocacy organization, uh, a lead organization, and then a collaboration of experts, other advocacy 
um, and clin clinicians and so on, um, all as part of that collaboration. But it's an advocacy group that, that actually files the nomination. And it doesn't start with a nomination, of course. It starts many, many years before that. So build this strong team. On the right side there is just the structure that we've put together for the MLD nomination. You can see that our expert advisory group, the orange dot at the top, um, is kind of the, the, the linchpin or the kingpin of, of what happens here. But we've got a lot of supports for them. In yellow are our external supports. In blue are working focus groups and so on. Know your publications and know what they say. Often your pharma groups, your, your pharma partners, um, have uh, departments uh, and resources. They're able to uh, survey publications and, and pull out information to uh, support your advisory group, but you should know that information as well and know where those gaps are. You know, we're struggling with uh, how effective is our therapy at birth? We've never been able to detect babies at birth before, so there's not a lot of published data in our space, and I probably in your space, about what happens to babies you know, that are a few months old that, that get access to a therapy. It might be 6, 12, 24 months is the normal time that your, your kids or later are, are diagnosed. But what happens when, when they get that therapy at birth? And you need to fill that gap. Um, and when you're advocating, when you're speaking to the committee, which we'll talk about in a moment, you want to start with some of this evidence. You want to always refer back to evidence because that's what the committee is listening for. Otherwise, they're going to be touched by your presentation and you might get a tear in their eyes or a sigh or whatever, and you're gonna show some wonderful pictures, uh, but um, that is not gonna help them in their decision process. Uh, next slide. Be connected, uh, be, be networked, not just on these sessions, but you know, Amy, Amy's not on the committee, but uh, you, know, the, you, you know how to get in contact with Amy. Well, guess what? You can get in contact with most of the rest of the committee members just about as, as easy and the people around them, but show up at the meetings. Um, start early, start years early. If you're not doing uh, a nomination right now, but you're thinking four, five, six years from now, I would start attending committee meetings. They're all virtual now, they're easy to get to. Uh, but when they go back in person, think about going back to DC and just rubbing elbows, having lunch and asking questions and those sorts of things. They meet quarterly. They always have community comments. Um, those community comments are uh, submitted both written uh, and verbal. And I would encourage you, written, written is okay, but verbal allows you to get some face time with the committee. Um, it allows them to start building some recognition uh, of your name, some trust with what you're saying. Um, and uh, it, it's just a great way to start expanding that network. Um, the Association of Public Health Labs, they have an annual meeting. Uh, they are the, um, uh, the, the group that advises, uh, that, that is a resource to all of uh, the, the state uh, public health labs. So APHL meeting is another place. They have a the dedicated uh, newborn screening conference uh, each year. And I would encourage you to consider that. And of course, the Every Life uh, Newborn Screening Boot Camp, which is underway. We finished week one last week, and week two and three are, are forthcoming this and next week. So again, Google that, and you'll be able to find the registration if you're not uh, participating. And then network outside of these committees as well, including the advocacy groups that have gone before you, those that have had success, and those that have struggled, maybe resubmitted, and so on. What, what have they learned? It's been a tremendous amount of, of effort put in by these groups and no sense uh, reinventing the wheel. Next slide. And don't forget the, uh, the family stories uh, as well. Um, that's important. And again, I apologize for formatting. Um, the story needs to make a point with a fact. So as you encourage uh, families to uh, present and share, and usually this happens more closely to an actual nomination being submitted, uh, but uh, they need to connect their personal story with the nomination. The committee knows that newborn screening saves lives. As I mentioned before, they're wonderful people, they're passionate. Newborn screening is their lives. They're, they're just deeply engaged in it. Um, there's not anybody on there that's, that's you know, arm's length and is just there you know, serving time. Um, work in advance and continually with your family advocates uh, to plan this out so that it makes sense. And of course, that's where you wanna bring in the personal stories and the pictures. On the left there is my daughter, Darcy, who passed away in 1995 at age 10 from MLD. And on the right uh, is my daughter, Lindy, uh, her older sister, who um, did not have access to therapy. Her birthday is today. She's going to live to 20. She's turning 41 today. So there you go. I just shared a little bit about my family. You know something more about me, a little bit more connection. This is what you want to do uh, with the committee members. And then uh, next slide. Um, I wanted to just highlight that this is, oh, and I apologize again for formatting. We cross platforms with this. Uh, I just wanted to, to highlight that this is a long journey. 
Um, on the left, that far left-hand dot in 2012 is when we started our assay development for NLB. In uh, mid-2022, next year, uh, is when we're targeting submitting the RUSP nomination. We've done a lot of work between uh, then and now, but that's, you know, that's basically 10 years. Um, and then RUSP approval is another 18 months after that. And the chart up at the top, um, if it was lined up properly, you could see the 22, we started maybe 5% of the nation's baby screen. But even at approval, that might be 10%. We might have a few more pilots in place and so on. But it's going to take us another couple of years before uh, we get a dramatic percentage of baby screen. And this is not state screening, but baby screen. So we might be at 75% or something like that by 2026. That's what, a 14-year journey. So start early. And if you have questions about that, again, feel free to reach out to me. I'll put my email back up in the, uh, uh, the chat as well. Uh, next screen, no, slide please. And the, um, the last comment is, I'll get a cleaned up copy of this for you, uh, Dylan, uh, so that you guys can share this out. Um, the advisory committee is part of a large, much larger ecosystem, as I pointed out earlier. So don't put all of your eggs into the ACHDNC basket. You want to make sure that you're working all parts of this system. Contact the state labs yourself. Uh, contact, uh, as I say, other advocacy groups. Make sure you're dealing on the reimbursement side because it does no good to have newborn screening if you can't get access to a therapy and you can't get it reimbursed. Make sure that you're, you're doing all of those things in parallel. And we used to call it going rogue. And uh, Every Life has done a wonderful job with uh, you know, making progress on rust alignment. So this is a little bit less of an issue. But, but feel free to reach out to labs and get screening in place with or without a RUSP nomination in place. If a lab's willing to start screening, then get on it and, and uh, make that happen. So with that, um, I thank you, appreciate your time. And again, I'll get a cleaned up set of slides that uh, PDF or whatever that you all can see later. Dean, thank you so much. So we will move um, into Q&A. Does anyone have any questions for Dean? I'm looking in the Q and A chat in the box, and I'm not seeing any. I don't see any in the chat either. So we will go ahead and move forward. And if you think of any questions for Dean, go ahead and add them to the Q and A box, and we will come back and look at those. Now we will move to Randy. Hi everyone, I'm Randy Kleitz, and unfortunately my um, internet is unstable, so I'm going to leave my screen off, um, but thank you, Caitlin, for putting the screens up today for us, and a uh, great presentation so far the entire time I've been making notes to change my presentation because you guys are covering a lot of what I was going to say, so thank you. Uh, so again, I'm Randy Kleitz, I'm the Rare Disease Policy Director for the Little Hercules Foundation, and I'm going to cover how to interact with your state uh, newborn screening officials. So I guess, you know, whenever you're advocating anytime, you just have to make sure that you identify the issue, um, that you are clearly um, advocating for something that you're comfortable advocating for because you will be asked a lot of questions and make sure you develop a clear advocacy plan. So uh, luckily when I joined the Lur Little Hercules Foundation during our strategic planning session, we made newborn screening and rest spell alignment uh, policies a priority with our team. We have been uh, meeting with the Every Life Foundation and it was also one of their priorities. So it worked out great that I could join along with Dylan and um, his consultant on the ground here in Ohio to work on uh, trying to make sure that Ohio uh, came up to the RUSP alignment and set together a timeline. So it was really easy for me to identify our issue um, and it really did work out perfectly. So um, the other thing that you really wanna make sure that you're doing, um, I know Dean talked about the federal process, but at the statewide level, there's also advisory councils that you should be monitoring. Uh, luckily also for us, um, our newborn screening advisory council went uh, virtual. And so I was able to go back and uh, kind of see some of the past um, past council meetings to find out who the key players were. Uh, building relationships within advocacy is always like level 101 advocacy. And so uh, I went back, uh, went through some of the meeting notes 
looked at uh, kind of who are the regular attendees, what groups are there to advocate, called on them to see if it was something that they would also help me advocate for uh, coming to RUSP alignment. Um, and that worked out really good for me. I found a mom of a child with SMA who um, had been advocating in the state uh, and she had actually worked with past legislation that was introduced. Um, and so that really worked out perfectly for us moving along the, the legislation that ended up coming in Ohio. Uh, we developed a plan and a backup plan, which is always super important. So uh, we have a two-year uh, biennium budget in Ohio where we can uh, put in issues. Usually it's more successful if those issues have been addressed some way in the state and another uh, general assembly, which we had that going for us because we did find that 2018 uh, legislation that we were able to go back and uh, pull up. And then we decided that we wanted to try and get that into the state budget process, which starts uh, in January. Um, starting to talk to the governor's office. Um, by March, the state legislature has it um, in the House. And then uh, by May, it's uh, into the Senate. And then it comes back over to the House and then uh, signed into law by July. So it's a very quick timeline. Uh, so you really have to have a backup plan because if you don't get your legislation into the state budget, uh, you have to have champions ready to go to introduce standalone legislation, which we were able to do also, which helped us in the long run. So Caitlin, you can go ahead to the next slide. So um, making sure that you focus on your priority and on realistic expectations. And um, I'm a realist, so I'm always kind of looking at what, what's the, the landscape of the legislature? Um, how can you make sure that you are able to introduce it in a way that will be accepted? And for us, um, we looked at uh, the Ohio panel didn't include ALD or SMA, uh, which had both um, been part of the RUSP. Uh, and so we thought we could definitely use that. As I mentioned before, we had past legislation to add SMA in, in 2018. Um, I went back to the lawmakers that had introduced that legislation and uh, they were both very surprised that it still was in the pilot project um, in Ohio. Um, we actually, unfortunately, had a good example for our legislation moving forward because of COVID. Um, in Ohio, some families uh, in their newborn screening panel did not have SMA included because it was in that project pilot or the pilot project. And so about three months or so were not tested. Um, and so we were able to use that example. I went back to the governor's office and let them know that this had happened. It had happened because it was not a mandatory um, expense for the Department of Health. And uh, with COVID, they were just moving funds um, around to make sure that they were taking care of what they felt was uh, the biggest priorities. And somebody decided SMA uh, coming out of the, the panel was a good idea idea. Uh, the governor's administration and the lawmakers did not agree. Uh, and so we were able to use that information that uh, advocates were able to um, pull up to, to get that priority into our state budget. Um, and so I think, you know, when you're looking at, can your state do this? Um, I think it's really in, important that you use examples to set a timeline to introduce your legislation and to recommend additional disorders to be added to the RUSP also, uh, which is in line with what Dylan was kind of talking about earlier, is to make sure that um, there's a timeline available. Uh, we were we were pretty successful in that also in our, our legislation that we added into the state budget. Uh, we did put together a timeline that includes about two years. Um, there's a timeline specifically for when uh, when the newborn screening panel advisory council needs to start their discussion on a new um, a new disorder that's been added, um, and then a certain timeline that they have uh, once they've made their decision to make sure that the policy aligns with the actual um, legis or the panel having those um, 
disorders included in the, the newborn screening. Um, I was able to also work with all the advocates. I it was a group of us on the ground that were working very hard to call on all of the leadership. And, and I know probably a couple of you are on this call, so I just want to make sure that it is really clear I did not do this alone. We have a really great group of advocates. And I think that that is one of the things that uh, made our legislation move so quickly was that we engaged all stakeholders. So I spent half of my time really um, trying to get educated about newborn screening. Um, I am a rare disease mom, but my son's um, condition does not have a newborn screening. Um, so I had to learn a lot in a short amount of time. And I'd really like to, again, thank the Every Life Foundation uh, for getting me caught up and up to speed uh, to make sure that I could become an, a champion for uh, all those who are looking to have their disorders added to the rare disease or to the um, newborn screening panel. Um, it was really important, too, that we worked very closely with the Department of Health and the governor's office uh, during all of our advocacy efforts. Um, so we were making sure that we were keeping them in the loop on how we were moving uh, this legislation through. Um, and I think that, you know, just remembering to do that uh, was super important in us being successful. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, Randy, thank you. So we do have some questions for you in the Q&A. Um, one is, how do you get labs to start screening before legislation is passed? Sorry, I, I would have to say that that's, and I know Dylan, um, this is something that we talked a little bit about too, so I don't know if you're still around, but I think, um, you know, working with your state and um, having people to come in and um, advocate for that is pretty much the only way that you can get it done before it's actually legislation. Dylan, I'm sure you have something to add too. Yep, I was actually just kind of answering uh, as Kaylin asked. I would say the best place to start is to reach out to your state newborn screening program and the state newborn screening lab to discuss the condition, feasibility of adding. Um, Again, how states will add conditions will vary based on state, uh, but opening that line, going back to Dean's point of opening that line of communication early uh, and bringing your story and talking to them about it, I would say the very minimum, that's where you're going to want to start, just so they're aware of what you're trying to do. You can be made aware of challenges uh, because uh, for any condition, rust or not rust, um, there's going to be challenges to add in that condition. And so Stop talking to somebody within the lab, within the program to start to understand those challenges, to start working through them and figuring out how best to add it to that state panel. Uh, I think because of that, the, the lab and the newborn screening program is, is a great place to start. Great, thank you, Dylan. Um, and this may be a question for both Randy and Dylan, um, but the next question, this person wants to know, does Russ have uh, disorders of interest, type of nomination or classification, um, you know, in, in, in the uh, a situation where there may not be um, an effective treatment, but the benefits of screening as it relates to, you know, existing early treatment options uh, would justify fast tracking newborn screening for a condition. Uh, I can answer. I think the, the short answer is no. Uh, okay. I think, um, Again, going back to Dean's point, the, the advisory committee is always looking at, they're looking at new ways to go to, to review this. Um, but I'm just gonna bring the question back up so I can make sure I'm answering it fully. Um, oh, there it is. Um, for the benefits. Hey Dylan, while you're reading that, I can jump in one quick second. I think this is really important for why um, I know I, was really involved in the Rare Disease Advisory Council coming to Ohio. And uh, one of the things that was really important in our legislation and our advocacy around that was making sure that we have good data collection points. And I think that this is one of those things that is really important. If there's a state who has a high incidence rate of a certain rare disease, this is, this is the perfect example of why that state could be the leader in allowing um, a condition that's not on the RUSP yet to get into their state 
newborn screening panel. So I think working together with those those groups that are that are emerging, that are working on more than just one rare disease, but working on groups of rare diseases, I think is really important, Dylan. Yeah, and just to finish on the point, looking at the question again, uh, having the effective assay is important though. The, the key part of the newborn screening system is because it is across the board and everyone is, uh, every newborn will go through newborn screening, they wanna make sure that you can properly identify the individual in a large population. Uh, and so having that effective assay is definitely a key part. And so it's definitely a, I think everybody is generally aware um, of conditions that could be coming down the pipeline in, in terms of who might be pursuing newborn screening, uh, but in terms of an official list or an official, we can add it soon list, uh, that doesn't exist. Great, well, thank you both uh, for answering those questions. Um, we are now going to move to our last speaker, and that is Ryan. So Ryan, I will go ahead and pass it over to you. It's Caitlin. Um, well, I know we're running up on time, so I'll try to be as abridged and brief as possible. Um, but I'm going to be speaking about the Advancing Access to Precision Medicine Act, um, but more generally about um, some of the legislative efforts that have been going on regarding um, genomic and genetic or DNA sequencing, um, mostly focused on this calendar year, but uh, a little bit of the history as well. So next slide, please. Um, so I guess the first thing to kind of explain is that there are really uh, three most common types of genetic tests um, for diagnosing patients who are suspected of um, having an underlying or rare disease caused by an underlying genetic condition, although um, there are many more. Um, there's just such a, such a wide array, thousands of different tests really available, but um, to pare it down to the three kind of main technologies, we have whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing and gene panels. And I'll get into a little bit about um, the difference between those later, but um, this is really important because um, these diagnostics um, get patients not only timely access to diagnoses, um, when oftentimes it you know, requires a patient's 4.8 years on average um, to receive one, but during the time when patients aren't diagnosed, um, many patients experiencing worse um, symptoms, develop additional medical complications, miss out on early interventions, and so much more. Um, so this is, um, it, getting these diagnoses is really just so important to the patients. And we talk about ending the diagnostic odyssey a lot of times. I know that's something that um, the Every Life Foundation is very um, big about, but um, we like to think about, you know, timely and sustainable access to these diagnostic testing um, because that um, allows patients to receive referrals um, to different therapies that can manage their disease. So even if there's not an FDA approved uh, treatment or therapy that currently exists, you're still able to kind of connect with a community that has recommendations on things that might work um, for your child or for your, um, for your patient. Um, you can also start to begin some of these um, non-pharmaceutical therapies, um, like physical, occupational speech therapy. Um, as I mentioned, you can build connections with specific disease um, communities. You can enroll in clinical trials to um, try some of these new um, therapies that are being developed, and you can also um, contribute to natural history studies um, for that disease, which is incredibly uh, critical towards um, getting new information and more information about these, um, these rare diseases available to um, doctors and scientists who are going to continue to study this down the line. Um, so next slide, please. So to kind of break down the differences between each test, um, again, there's, there's really such a wide variety in these and I'm not a geneticist by trade. Um, so it's not something that I'm particularly in depth familiar at, but um, to kind of break it down um, very, very generally for everybody, um, each test um, has different variations that'll vary from each type of laboratory that they come from. Um, and they also 
detect a patient's genetic code differently and detect different variations across the board. So um, the depth of sequencing, which means the number of times that each nucleotide of uh, the DNA is read, affects how accurately and reliably variants in a patient's genetic code are detected. So we like to think about at a higher sequencing depth um, that you can have better coverage and fewer errors, which leads a higher confidence. Um, but, um, but it also increases the cost of the sequencing. So um, when we look at, I guess, first the, the whole genome sequencing, um, we see that it looks at almost all, almost all of, an, of a patient's entire genome um, but given the amount um, of information that's sequenced, it increases, um, increases, excuse me, in the depth that you're reading, really, um, really increase the cost of finding a diagnosis as well, so that you have a little bit higher confidence in, in what you're seeing. Um, whole exome sequencing is a little bit different because it, um, it examines the sections of the code of your genome that are specifically um, building the proteins, which is um, where the majority of disease causing variations occur. So while these can be offered at a higher um, read depth, um, just because you're sequencing closer to about five to 10% of the genome, um, there's less genetic material being analyzed. So it can be a little bit more difficult um, to find exactly what you're looking for still, but you can go to a little bit more depth. Um, and then finally with gene panels, um, these tests observe specific genes or other regions that are associated um, with diseases with specific symptoms. So if a patient's showing um, symptoms for, um, let's say, epilepsy, you can look at um, a specific region of the DNA that, that is associated with um, those epilepsy symptoms and look for what change might be there. Um, so these are typically able to be analyzed at the highest depth because of their specificity in what they are looking at within the whole picture of the of a person's genome. So next slide, please. Um, so to take you through briefly uh, a timeline of the legislative efforts, this kind of um, first began all the way back in 2018. So we're going back to Congresses now um, when Representative Swalwell introduced uh, the Advancing Access to Precision Medicine Act, which is, um, of course, the, the bill that I'm I was supposed to be talking to you about today, but um, just wanted to know that there's another version out there, which is uh, the ending diagnostic, ending the Diagnostic Odyssey Act. So, um, key differences between these two bills really focus on, uh, excuse me, which tests are required. So, um, it's it's honestly shifted. Um, whereas in the very beginning, the Advancing Access to Precision Medicine Act uh, wanted to cover whole genome sequencing. And then the ending, the Diagnostic Odyssey Act became the one that wanted to cover just whole genome sequencing, while the um, new and improved uh, 2019 version of the Advancing Access to Precision Medicine Act um, was going to cover the wider array of tests. So it can be a little bit confusing. So to, to kind of take you through it, um, Representative Swalwell first introduced the bill and then um, decided that he wanted to make some improvements to it. Senator Pete, or excuse me, Representative Peters then introduced um, a very similar version of that bill, the next Congress, while Representative Swalwell introduced his uh, new and updated version. And then um, in the Senate, they were able to get um, the Representative Peters version um, introduced. Coming back to this year, a lot of the focus on legislative efforts has been around um, trying to get Representative Peters and Representative Swalwell to agree to a bill since they're both um, part of the Democratic caucus making sure that Democrats are able to be unified on this issue so that um, members of their own party aren't having to really um, pick sides between which type of legislation they'd wanna support. And because you know a bill really can't go through the process um, if there are two competing versions uh, within, its own, uh, within its own caucus. So um, with, with that effort um, going on, we were excited to see that it was, um, that there was bracketed language included in uh, the Cures 2.0 discussion draft, which came out in June this year. So that was led by uh, Representatives Upton and DeGette, who were obviously um, the champions and um, sponsors of the uh, 21st Century Cures uh, before. 
And um, just right before that, a week before um, Kirstie Borno was unveiled, the Ending the Diagnosis Act was reintroduced in the Senate, um, straight re reintroduction, no changes to it. But uh, some of the changes that we've been seeing in um, Section 407, and uh, this is important to note because it was bracketed language. So that means um, that within the, the discussion draft, they were really looking for public comment on it. So um, the assistance fund where I work provided it. Um, I know Every Life did as well. I'm uh, hopeful that a number of other organizations that are still listening to this call did, but um, this, um, this bracketed language leaned much more closely towards the Advancing Access to Precision Medicine Act. And that really focused on um, allowing um, patients and doctors to um, pick whichever of these tests is best for an individual patient because, um, because these, these clinicians and these physicians have so much more insight into uh, patient-specific outcomes um, and what they're experiencing that they have um, probably a, a more apropos recommendation than we could just uh, write into legislation. So that's really something that we wanted to make sure that um, somebody who's knowledgeable about these differences is the one who's able to write it. And given that there's so much complexity over um, not only the, the type of test that you would select, but which tests of the available um, kinds from each laboratory or manufacturer, um, wanting to make sure that those who are really um, knowledgeable about that are the ones who are able to make those decisions and that they have every really tool available to them instead of um, limiting doctors um, to certain, certain um, tools that they would be able to use and diagnostic tests based on insurance coverages. So, oh, excuse me. Um, well, I guess that's kind of it. I see there's a question, so I'm happy to read that. Great, thank you. Um, yes, feel free, we'll go through the questions. I'm looking in the Q&A box and I'm not seeing any there. Uh, did you see the question in the chat box? Yes. Um, I'm unfamiliar with um, the NBS system. Um, I don't know quite what's in it. What we do know is that um, at least whole genome and whole exome have been um, kind of verified by the American College of Medical Geneticists who are really on the ball with um, with the, the test as, you know, the organization for geneticists. Um, and they recommend whole genome or whole exome as a first or second tier test um, for diagnosing these patients who are suspected of having rare diseases. Um, but what we're seeing is that we're unclear about what the coverage is for patients uh, in different state Medicaid plans. So um, a patient in California might have access to whole genome, but they might not have access to um, whole exome sequencing, for example. So um, I'm trying to figure out um, where that is. And that's part of the bill that we're looking to find is um, more information about the coverage gaps, um, as well as some of some more information about um, what we what else would be helpful um, to, to get states to um, pick up the tab and, and make sure that they're covering these tests. Yeah, and, and if you don't mind, Ryan, I, let me just clarify, because I asked the question, I, the, we are using sequencing as a final diagnostic confirmation in some of the newborn screens, but it's very targeted. It would come into the targeted sequencing because of turn time, uh, cost, uh, just efficiency. Uh, I just wanted to make uh, a clarifying comment for kind of the broader audience here that what you're talking about here is the bigger picture of a diagnostic tool uh, and how that is reimbursed and how patients can access that in this context of, of your presentation, mostly outside of newborn screening, even though we're seeing some of it in newborn screening. We're not ready in newborn screening to have whole genome or whole exome sequencing across the board. Uh, there's just, it's very complicated. That's, that's for another time to discuss. Okay, great. And we have one more question for you, Ryan. Um, since gene panels are less expensive, but typically broad and specific to classes of disorders, um, would it be feasible and cost effective to have gene panels for newborn screening uh, that target diseases with current treatment options? 
Um, it could be. Again, that's a question that I, as not a trained professional, I can't really say what would be best recommended for a patient. I can say that I think gene panels have the advantage of, of patients who are showing symptoms um, that can be more targeted to specific genes, in which case uh, I think a lot of times they are cheaper, but that's not you know generally across the board. Again, that'll have to do with how much um, depth you need to go into when you're looking at the specific tests um, and at the patient's um, gene sequencing. So um, I can't really answer that, but I do think that gene panels are a great all option because for many times, uh, given the more specificity of them, they are generally cheaper. Great. Well, thank you so much, Ryan. And to all of our speakers today, we really appreciate you all. Um, we will be hosting our next RDLA monthly webinar on October 21st at noon. Um, if anyone that is joining us today would like to speak or present on a topic, um, please email me. My email is there on the screen. And lastly, we just would like to thank our September RDLA webinar supporters. Um, you can see our sponsors at the top, along with each of our presenters, organizations, and our Rare Hub partners. Um, so again, thank you to all of our speakers and thank all of you for joining us today. Have a good day.